And thank you all for coming out today. And many thanks to our panelists for making the time to meet with us as we gather here from all parts of Ohio this morning. I'm the Reverend Joan Van Beesler, Director of Unitarian Universalist Justice Ohio. And my co-host in this segment is Tad Pinkston of Pinkston Law, and he's also a member of the UJO board. And then we'll introduce our panelists in just a moment. And for those of you who aren't familiar with UUJO, UU Justice Ohio, we're a 501c3 organization that serves the 38 UU congregations and, and fellowships across Ohio. And our mission is to offer education and advocacy and opportunities for action consistent with UU liberal religious principles and then also to witness on at, with and on behalf of marginalized groups and individuals. As uh, Samuel said later on, you're going to hear about Our Voices Together, a new coalition of over 30 nonprofits throughout the state that are working together right now to combat the anti-democracy bills that we see in Ohio. And Kristen Byrice, our coalition organizer and tech person extraordinaire this morning, is going to tell you about how you can get involved, and that will come later. Because we believe that we must come together as a community across all of our different divisions to help preserve our rights and work to realize the promise of our democracy. Tad? Hi, folks. Tad Pinkson here, as introduced earlier. So we had a very smooth election process here in Ohio in 2020. Unfortunately, the aftermath of the election and its current proliferation of anti-protest, anti-First Amendment bills leaves me and I think us more broadly deeply, deeply concerned about our democracy in 2021. We appreciate the chance to share these concerns this morning and hear what our panelists think about the state of our democracy here in Ohio and the nation more broadly. We want to know about policies they support to address the serious challenges undermining our democracy and how we might strengthen democracy here in Ohio. Joan, I'll throw it back to you to introduce our, some of, do the first introduction for our panelists. Certainly. Um, we're going to introduce our panelists. The first one I want to introduce is State Senator Nikki Antonio from Lakewood. And she says she's honored to be serving in the Ohio Senate, representing uh, District 23, and she's in leadership as the assistant minority leader. Now, Senator Antonio is serving her first term in the Ohio Senate after four terms in the House. She is a dedicated champion of workers' rights, high quality education, local governments, equal rights for women, and the LGBTQI community, as well as health care for all and fighting the opioid crisis. Senator Antonio is the ranking member on the Health and Transportation Committees, sits on the Finance, Higher Education, and Workforce uh, Committees in Ways and Means. The first in her family to graduate from college, I can relate to that, me too. <laughs> Senator Antonio holds a bachelor's degree in education from Cleveland State University and a master's in public administration from the Maxine Levine College of Urban Affairs at CSU. She and her wife live in Lakewood and are the proud parents of two wonderful daughters. Tad? All right, I'll introduce Representative Terrence Upchurch. Before his time in Columbus, State Representative Terrence Upchurch served as a special assistant to the Cleveland City Council. From his time working in City Council, Representative Upchurch has learned and developed a keen understanding of the nuances of government, which he now brings to the State House. Born and raised in Greater Collinwood and Glenville communities, Representative Upchurch now serves District 10 by helping municipalities meet the basic needs of its citizens. While Representative Upchurch has many projects he's working on and fighting for at the state legislator, he is currently sponsoring bills that would prohibit discrimination in rental housing based on income and seeks to expand marijuana legisla uh, legalization. Um, Turning back to you, John. Okay. Now, our third panelist is uh, State Representative David Leland from the 22nd Ohio House District. And I don't believe he is with us yet, 
but uh, just to say that uh, he may come in a little bit later. He has uh, served uh, for more than 48 years. During this time, he's volunteered with many local community organizations. Uh, his commitment to community service was recognized by the OSU Alumni Association with its Citizenship Award. Now, he was first elected to the Ohio House of Representatives at age 29. And he authored seven bills into law and was voted the outstanding freshman state rep in the 115th General Assembly. Then in 1995, Representative Leland was elected to the first of four terms as chair of the Ohio Democratic Party, then returned to the Ohio House in 2014. And now in 2019, Representative Leland was honored by the Ohio Public Transit Association as legislator of the year. So thank you all. And like I said, we'll uh, be um, highlighting Representative Leland's picture as soon as he's here. He is here. Thank oh, he is here. Thank you. All right, then. So thank you all. And just to say, after voters turned out in record numbers in so many of our states across the country in November, and after the large protests last summer resulting from the murder of George Floyd and the anger over police violence, a number of lawmakers in different states are now responding with attempts to consolidate power through legislative attacks on democracy itself, specifically the right to vote and our First Amendment rights to assemble and engage in public witness and critical speech. And this includes Ohio. So now we're gonna hear some opening statements from the panelists and then ask a few questions that Tad and I came up with. And then we're gonna ask you to put your questions for the panelists in the chat box and we'll turn to those as well. Tad? Okay, thank you. So um, first question is kind of a broad one. I'd like to hear from each of our panelists on this. So the right to vote is the bedrock of Amer American democracy. The right to freedom of assembly and speech are also foundational. We are troubled that access to voting has become a partisan issue and is now threatened here in Ohio as well as many states. We are looking at the anti-protest bills currently in Ohio, things like House Bill 22, 109, Senate Bill 41, Anti-voter and anti-protest bills appear to be a large, a part of a larger pattern of assault on our democratic principles. Um, panelists, given all this, what do you think about the state of democracy here in Ohio and in our nation? And uh, I guess I'll just start with the one that I, I see first on my screen. So Representative Upchurch, if you wouldn't mind taking the first swing at this. Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, Representative Leland, it's always good to see you. Senator Antonio, always good to see you as well. I hope you're well. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. It, it, it seems that uh, our democracy is under attack. Uh, voting should be made easy, plain and simple. Uh, and we have seen uh, this last election cycle that uh, when people of color mobilize and they vote, they have numbers uh, and they get favorable outcomes. And these bills are attempts to try to stifle that ability to mobilize and vote. And when I look at the state of our democracy, I definitely think that it's in jeopardy. Um, <clears throat> we should be encouraging voting. We should be getting more people registered to vote and we should embrace higher voter turnout. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a different perspective in this country of uh, people who wanna cling to what they have. And the only way to do that uh, is to suppress the vote of others. Uh, so unfortunately, I believe that's going to be the challenge down the road, and this has become a partisan issue, and uh, this is the fight that we're going to be embarking upon. So, uh, you know, I'm proud to support voter rights, and I'm proud to uh, support the ability and the access to vote. It should be made easier. Uh, it should be open and accessible, uh, and that's going to be the challenge, uh, especially as we continue with election cycles, and these bills are going to continue to come, and as they come, we got to continue to fight them. So, uh Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Um, I suppose, Senator Antonio, if you'd like to address uh, the question next, thank you. Sure, and I just wanna say thank you so much for inviting me back. Um, I've attended this event a few years now, and as a fellow UU, it's good to be with family. Um, I serve in the minority in so many different ways in my life, and uh, so one of it's nice to be in a gathering of uh, fellow Unitarians as well, and and those who really believe in um, freedom and democracy for all people. 
which is part of the bedrock of, um, I think, what drew me to being a Unitarian Universalist to begin with. So thanks for, thanks for the invitation. Um, and I, it's always good to see my colleagues, uh, Representative Upchurch and, uh, and Representative Leland. Um, you have, <laughs> in them, you have a wealth of experience and knowledge as well. So um, thanks so much for that. You know, um, as Representative Upchurch just said, uh, we can't help but connect some of the dots on what happened with this past election um, in terms of electing a Democratic president and then um, seeing this massive voter turnout even during a pandemic. And while Ohio lagged behind, we can um, continue to do the diagnostics on that. And uh, a lot of folks have, have looked, to, there are multiple reasons why Ohio ended up the way it did in this last election. But the bottom line is that when the people speak, and frankly, they've been speaking in the popular election, if we look at that, for, for many cycles now, their voices aren't always um, the ultimate decider, as we saw in the last uh, presidential election previously, but um, in that the popular vote did not elect that president. Instead, we got the president that was elected through the Electoral College. That's what I mean by that. Um, so as these voter suppression laws um, and, and anti anti-democracy bills are before us, there are more than 400 bills that have been introduced across the state, across the country, I mean. And um, they're in over, I think it's over 35 states. Uh, that, that number may be higher. What does this tell us? And they're happening, these, these bills are happening in states that, um, there was a Republican majority outcome and they're happening in states where there was a Democratic party outcome. So, so it's transcending party politics, but overall these bills have been, there's, there is a common denominator in that these suppression bills are being introduced by Republican members of their general assemblies at the state level. Um, so what that tells us is as our, people on the ground express their uh, voice and want that one person, one vote. And when they express it, um, now there has to be a new strategy to quash their voices and to silence them. And so it means uh, making it more difficult for people to vote, making it um, more difficult for people to um, use their First Amendment right of free speech. Now I find this, and I'm sure many of you find, the irony is not lost on any of us, right? That at the same time in the Ohio General Assembly, we have colleagues that are fighting so hard for Second Amendment rights. You know, I think guns have more rights than people in this state sometimes. Um, the right to have a gun everywhere, not be trained to use it, and the list just goes on and on and on. And yet, when we um, would like to see the same fervor for First Amendment rights, the right to free speech, the right to protest, gather and assemble, then suddenly, somehow, those rights <laughs> are not necessarily... Uh, in the mix with the bills that are um, introduced by the majority. And so, and so we have a real challenge in front of us. Um, the good news, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about hopeful stuff later, but I think the good news is that we have conversations like this, that people um, have their eyes wide open to what is really going on. And I think forums like this are so important. The state of democracy is also challenged by things that I've been working on uh, to change for a long time. Uh, the fact that we're still a state that um, uses the death penalty and whether we have sort of an informal uh, hold right now, uh, which we do, but at any moment the governor could change his mind and um, begin executions. That's problematic. And to me, that is also a threat to democracy. The fact that in the state of Ohio, members of the LGBTQ community do not have equal rights. 
um, cannot um, move freely um, for fear of in 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 the public sphere uh, for fear of being re uh, refused service uh, in a restaurant in a hotel. The fact that they can be denied housing, fired from their job just for being who they are and who they love, that is a threat to our democracy because. If, if we're not all experiencing the same level of freedom and democracy, then none of us are. And as, as Representative Upchurch pointed out, um, the violence that we see against members of our community and black and brown communities, our infant mortality rates that are disproportionately, again, um, affected in black and brown communities, it, it tells us um, very clearly that our democracy is threatened and that we, uh, at the end of the day, have a lot of work to do. Um, fortunately, the representation in the State House, in both the House and the Senate, there are people working, but um, we are still the deep, deep, deep minority. And um, so it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we can change that um, especially as we look to voters and having access to the ballot box. I mean, ultimately, I think that's where the key lies to being um, good steward of our democracy. You know, uh, Benjamin Franklin, when they, when they were working on the, um, on the Constitution and he came out and they said, what do we have? And he said, you have a republic if you can keep it. And it's up to all of us to work so hard to keep it. So thanks uh, for inviting me here today. And I'm uh, looking forward to the continued conversation. Thank you so much, Senator Antonio. And Representative Leland, if you could give us some of your thoughts on the state of democracy, that would be much appreciated. Oh, Representative, you're muted. Thank you. There we go. There we go. There we go. So thank you for um, inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be uh, with uh, Senator Antonio and Representative Upchurch. I want both of them to see my Cleveland Indians hat in the background here in case you didn't get a chance to uh, look at my background because I have the most important things uh, in my background as far as uh, Zoom calls are concerned. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to join this group today. Uh, I might be taking just a little bit different tact on what's been talked about today, but um, look, the fight for democracy has always, we, we've been, always been fighting for this, okay? This isn't anything new. We've been fighting for democracy, for, for voter rights, for people's ability to participate in their government since 1796. I mean, when we first started, only white men with property could vote. And then as we, as we moved on down the line, as far as abolitionists were concerned with the 15th Amendment, then the 19th Amendment, and then the Voting Rights Act of the 1960s, I mean, we've been fighting this fight for a long time. This isn't anything new. That doesn't mean that it's not important now, but it's just something that's part and parcel of who we are. It's, it's, it's about the struggle. And the struggle to make a more perfect union is an ongoing struggle. It's not something that just happened to us in the 21st century. It's been part of the American experience since 1796. Now it's our turn. It's our turn to, 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 to stand up and be part of this struggle. And, and that's what we're doing. And that's what you're doing. And that's why I commend you and, and everybody who's part of this organization to be doing it. But this is an interesting time. This is an interesting time because um, really democracy only works, uh, a republic only works, if one side is willing to concede defeat. Um, because if, 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 if their interests supersede the vitality of the democracy, in other words, if they think that what they stand for and what they believe in is more important than the um, establishment or the creation or the maintaining of the democracy, uh, then they tried to escape from it or they tried to do the kind of things that we're seeing from state to state to limit it, to limit the participation. And I think we saw that uh, on January 6th. We saw that January 6th at the, at the nation's capital, the first major insurrection uh, that this country has seen since 1861. Um, and, and we saw that people were willing to sacrifice the democracy in order to pursue their own agenda. 
And that happened before in 1861, when, when 17 or no, 11 states decided to sacrifice the democracy uh, for their own agenda. And so that's what we're dealing with here today. And I'm happy to talk about, um, you know, both those bills that you talked about are mostly in my committee. I'm the ranking member of the House uh, Criminal Justice Committee, and so I'm happy to talk about them later. But I just want to finish this particular thought. There's nothing special about a democracy. Democracy is just a vehicle. It's just a vehicle to do what you need to do. There's nothing good, but there's nothing bad about this vehicle. It's just a vehicle. You can make the argument. You can make the argument. I mean, when you look at American history, you look at world history, you can make the argument that in the 1860 election, the pro-slavery vote in the United States of America was 61% with only 38%, 39% going to Abraham Lincoln. You can make the argument that had they not been splintered off into three other candidates, Abraham Lincoln may not have been elected president and the democracy would have been responsible for that. So, and if you look at the voting record in the state of Ohio, the times that we've had the greatest turnout in the state of Ohio as far as elections, turnouts of over 70% in the state of Ohio, more times than not, I think, I think most of the times, I can think of one exception, we've elected Republicans. Republicans have been the beneficiary of an overwhelming turnout um, in, in Ohio elections. So democracy is just a vehicle. It's a vehicle that can be used by anybody. It can be used by us, it can be used by them, it can be used by anybody who is organized. So that's when I wanna to get to the most important point. When I was a young man or a kid, my parents, had an, had, had an album, and it was by Paul Robeson, and one of the songs on the album was um, a song about a labor organizer by the name of Joe Hill, and the song was, I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, and my parents would play this over and over again, and the reason I bring it up is that part of the message on the song is, you don't mourn the death of Joe Hill, you organize. It's all about organizing. We're not going to win elections. We're not going to win positions. We're not going to win on issues just by saying, okay, everybody go out and vote and the, may the best person win. We win because we organize, we get our message, we educate people as to what's important, why it's important that certain people or certain issues get elected. That's the importance. That's the usefulness of democracy, but it has to be part of an organization process that is educating people, that is getting people to understand what's in their best interest. I think we're seeing that happening right now with the president. I think he's moving along the right direction. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening that are going to enhance the economic well-being of the people of the United States. And I think when people's economic well-being is enhanced, then it, that, that, just, that takes away a lot of the radicalism that, that people then resort to when they're feeling economic distress. Because, you know, when you've got enough money to go take a vacation at Myrtle Beach and buy that F Ford 150 and to maybe send your kids to college, then you're not quite as interested in what other people are doing or who's coming over the border or who, who may be taking your job or who's telling you who may be taking your job. You're not quite as, as interested in buying into that rhetoric when you have a satisfactory life that you feel comfortable with. And that's what, and that's what uh, Joe Biden is doing right now. So it, my only thought is the democracy is important. We need to make sure that we, that we give people the opportunity to vote, but we can't leave it to themselves to decide what's important. We have to be organizing, organizing, and organizing to make sure the, 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 the America that we wanna see, the Ohio that we wanna see becomes a reality. Thank you so much for those comments, uh, Representative Leland. And, you know, I, I, I'm struck by, you know, kind of the state of, of things here. And I, I guess for, for our panelists and, and whoever feels called to can, can answer this question first, but where can we find hope in, in this process? Where, where do you see hope, perhaps more particularly? Um, if anyone feels called to answer, please, please do so. Well, I guess I'm, well, I, I think, uh, oh, okay. No, go ahead, Senator, please. Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, we're both hopeful, which is a good thing. Um, 
you know, I find hope in, as I said before, I mean, in forums like this, I have to tell you, this is probably the third or fourth uh, group that I've been in front of and having a conversation with in the past uh, week or two. And uh, to, to Representative Leland's point, it's the people taking things, um, looking at what's going on, knowing that we're a representative government and saying, okay, how do we organize ourselves to be able to have the democracy we want to see? And pushing back against some of these very draconian attempts at keeping people out of the conversation. You know, I that gives me a lot of hope. Um, when people gather in spite of um, being told that there may be dire consequences for doing it. And again, um, I, I appreciate the history lesson that the representative gave us to remind us, history is important for us, to remind us that we come from a long line of folks who protested, who, who overcame a lot of odds to be able, people risked their lives and died for First, the right to vote. We just celebrated the 100 year anniversary of women having the right to vote. And yet we do not have bodily autonomy in this country. Um, and, so, and so there is so much for us not to ignore and not to go to, on vacation for, for those people that can afford to do that. But to actually say, this is, this is my right and I'm not going to let someone take it from me, but I need to find other like-minded people to work with. And so um, the organizing, the groups that formed after the 2016 uh, presidential election that are still going strong now, new groups supporting new kinds of candidates, um, groups educating themselves like never before, um, all of that gives me great hope. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Upchurch, if you wanted, if you wanted to give your your take, thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. And you know, and I agree with uh, Senator Antonio. Uh, when I look around and see what's happening in this country, it, it gives me hope. And I think about what my grandmother would always tell me: hope is the last thing you can hold on to. Don't ever let it go. Uh, you know, people are mobilizing, people are getting engaged, people are getting activated, and people are sick and tired of of seeing. Uh, certain people get ahead in this country and, and, and not allowing it to be inclusive for everyone. Um, and I think about, and Rep Lee was a historian, so he can help me with this quote. I think about what Martin Luther King once said, we will wear them down with our capacity to suffer. We will always continue to fight and continue to push uh, for what is right in this country. And that's what gives me hope. We've been fighting this long and we're going to keep fighting. So, you know, I'm always going to be hopeful and I'm just proud to be a part of the fight. So, so we all remember, you know, since we're staying on the Martin Luther King theme, we always represent a representative of church. We always remember that the um, arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, okay? And it doesn't bend by ju towards justice just accidentally. It bends towards justice because people sit on that arc of justice and make it bend, make the arc of history and make it bend toward justice. And, and that's what we need to do. And that's what we need to do. And that's what we, ne we need to go. Um, you know, every, every significant public purpose in this country, progressive action that has occurred in this country has started in the streets and ended up in the ballot box. Everyone, anything that we've ever achieved in this country has started in the streets and ended up either in the legislature or in the Congress or at the ballot box. But it starts by the people. It doesn't start with people like us, not the three of us. It doesn't start with people like us. It starts in the street, but it ends up in the, in the legislature or the Congress or the ballot box. And that's why citizen mobilization organization is so, so very important. We have some absolutely fabulous questions in the chat box. Oh, Senator Antonio, did you want to say something? I was right. just going to say that um, people like us, you know, sometimes started out as 
activists and advocates. I certainly did. I know Representative Upchurch did. And to everybody that's on this call today, I would say um, that anyone can become one of us <laughs> in the legislature too. And that when you have that kind of a background coming into something like the legislature or a local office, it really informs your perspective and you have the ability to work with your um, fellow community members to make that change as well. It's a, it's a nice conduit sometimes. Thank you. So let me start then with a couple of questions from the chat. But I think the first one is, do any of the panelists have questions for each other? You guys get the first crack at the questions. Got a baseball trivia question there, Terrence, for me? <laughs> oh. No, I know better. Not in front of everybody. I know better than that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, if, if not, let me give you one here and let's see where we go. Um, of course, we've been talking about House Bill 22 and House Bill 109 and Senate Bill 41 and, of course, Senate Bill 16 has been revised, but, you know, these have been the uh, anti-protest bills. And one of our folk, Lori Albright, asks, what are the most effective avenues to push back against these measures and the anti-voter bill coming up? It seems so obvious that they're unconstitutional, but where do we target? Where should we target? our energies to make the most impact? So I guess I'll take a stab at this. Um, I'll start with the fact that what the rhetoric that you're hearing on all of these bills right now could have been written by one of the characters from George Orwell's uh, 1984 in terms of, you know, the, the, the word speak and the, um, and, and sort of twisting everything around uh, in the messaging that really at the end of the day, this is good for you. And this will just improve and, and make our, um, whether it's, whether we're talking about voting, it's gonna make it stronger for everything else. We're gonna protect everyone. Um, so I think the first thing, the very first thing, again, is what you're doing today is, is, is um, digging down and being informed and connecting with organizations that really tell it like it is, that go through step by step and say, here's, here's what this really means. Um, I think that's the first step. And sharing that knowledge and information with as many people as possible is, is also very, very important to be able to talk to your friends and your family and your neighbors, um, you know, not all the time because then they won't want to have dinner with you, but, um, <laughs> but, but at least, you know, talking to people about this. And then it's, it really comes to letting your representatives and legislators know that um, you have a problem with this and that in, the, in, in your best interest, they want you, you want them to focus on things that um, expand rather than uh, repress the vote and the like, and that do not take away your right. A lot of times people will say, well, my representative is, uh, you know, on board with me, so what good does it do? It's good for us to hear from you when you want to, I love it when people tell me they agree with where I'm standing, that helps make it stronger and, and bolster me. At the same time, um, and maybe Representative Leland can talk about this because a lot of these bills are in committees he's on right now. If, you're rep if you've communicated with your representative, the next step is the chair and the members of the committee to let them know um, if the bills are in their committee. That's a very powerful way um, to let them know where you stand and also the leadership. So the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, they need to hear from you too, because you are a member of the state of Ohio, you're a citizen of the state of Ohio, and what they do affects you. So let me piggyback a little bit on uh, all those great things that Senator Antonio said. Um, she's right, these bills are in my criminal justice committee. I serve as the ranking Democrat uh, in the House on the, and the criminal justice committee, and we have right now House Bill 22, we have House Bill 109, and House Bill 99, which 
you didn't mention, but should be yeah. what should be mentioned because House Bill 99 is the guns in school bill um, that is before our committee. So what has happened here? What's happened to these bills is kind of a boilerplate or a template for what how to fight this kind of pro reactive legislation. Um, through various work with various people and organizations, Joan was one of the people who testified um, uh, in, in, in this process. Um, we have been able to mobilize people uh, about how terrible this legislation is. When 99 first came for his opposition testimony, 133 people uh, filed either personal or written testimony in opposition. So many people that they had to shut the process down. And, and, after, and after, the, um, after those numbers of people demonstrated their opposition, then members of the other side uh, started making entreaties about coming together, putting together an interested party meeting. Maybe we can make this adjustment. Maybe we can make that adjustment. It obviously had a huge impact on everybody. When, when, when we saw people from the community, from the police, from the teachers, from everybody coming down and saying that this was actually going to make uh, our children less safe in schools if this was going to be passed. The same thing happened with House Bill 22. This happened uh, two weeks ago. House Bill 22, uh, which is the pro-police bill, the bill that gives police extra power that they obviously don't need. Um, if anybody read uh, Judge Marbley's a report from the district court yesterday, you can see that the problems that we had, at least in Columbus, uh, mostly promulgated from overreaction by the police force. So this is exactly the opposite of, of what we ought to be doing. We heard uh, uh, just scores of people came down from Cleveland, from various other places, from Cincinnati, to testify, testify how bad House Bill 22 was. They were going to shut down the hearing on House Bill 22, but the people wouldn't have it. They talked to the speaker. The speaker said, no, you're going to go forward and we're going to have this committee. So we continued the committee up until session. And then we came back after session so that all the people that were there could come in and testify. And we heard one after another after another. And now this week when we're meeting um, in the Criminal Justice Committee, neither 99 or 109 or 22 uh, is on the agenda. So, so I think that it, it, we send a very strong message as to, um, as to what the people can do. Look, I understand the process. Everybody, Terrence and, and Nikki, we all understand the process. We're in the minority. Uh, you know, if, if somebody really, really wants to do something, they can, they can pretty much do it because they have the votes. But it's our responsibility to, to make sure that they, if they do that, that they, they get as much blowback from the public and from the and from the community and from the media, as as we can possibly generate, so that they have to think twice about taking these very extreme steps in the state of Ohio. So keeping the pressure on is what we're going to be doing. It, it's it's an ongoing thing. It's twenty four seven. We're engaging people all the time. We need help from organizations like this and other organizations across the state to make sure people understand. Because if they can do this under the cloak of darkness, if they can do this without the public knowing that it's happening, then it'll pass through very easily. The only way we can keep them checked to a certain extent is by making sure they have to do this right on Main Street. Thank you so much. I see that uh, Representative Upchurch did have another obligation at 11. So I would like to thank him again for his time that he had here. Um, I just wanted to make sure folk knew then that we appreciated his time. Um, Reverend Joan, did you want yeah. to ask the panelists another question? Well, yeah, there's kind of a follow-up to this one because, um, you know, admitted that uh, going to the um, hearings and, and testifying and then going to people's offices and visiting with them or taking them out for coffee, et cetera, are really great ways of, of uh, making our point um, heard. But what about other methods? What other advocacy methods uh, do you think are best? Is that letters, email, texts, phone calls, protests outside the office? I mean, what, what else is a way of, of having our voice heard? All of the above. I mean, <laughs> again, this is, you know, at the times when we've, um, you know, as, as Representative Leland just pointed out, I, 
people showing up at the state house and and look for the past year that's been really difficult we've been there uh the legislators have been there with skeleton staff but um there you know for a long time it wasn't possible or safe for people to come to the state house that's starting to change now as as more and more people come back and so um that's powerful no not everyone can do that and we realize that using social media is powerful um and and really again when there's this collective effort where it's happening through a letter, it's happening through phone calls, visits, um, I think, you know, as summer approaches, it's very effective to try to meet with legislators in the community, you know, get a group of people together and ask for a meeting in their district. Um, I meet with people all summer long, um, coffee shops, and we don't have official offices, but there are, there are certainly ways to do that. I mean, um, I think all of it is, is effective and powerful. And remember that when you're doing things like that, like putting things on social media, um, standing together in solidarity at the state house, you're also educating more people that may not tap in or may not join you, but they're paying attention. And um, so I think that's important. Letters to the editor in local um, newspapers are important. Um, again, putting things on different message boards and um, sending things around on your social media groups, I think is really, really important and all adds to the mix. Okay. I think she said, I can't add anything to it. She said it exactly what, what needs to happen. Okay. Then well, we know what our marching orders are. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, so Colette in the chat asks, how do you see the end of gerrymandering in Ohio impacting democracy in Ohio? So I guess there's kind of two parts of that question. One, um, the kind of the status of gerrymandering and two, wh what impact is that going to have here for, for our state? Well, uh, you know, Senator Antonio may have a different opinion than I do. I don't think we've seen the end of gerrymandering in the state of Ohio. I think that we may see some minor changes to how gerrymandering is implemented in the state of Ohio, and it, it's probably better because it could it would be hard to be it would be hard to be worse uh, than what, what we've experienced in the last few uh, decades. Um, but I don't think we've seen the end of gerrymandering. We're going to see a different system. It's going to be it's going to have some uh, guardrails, which is good because we haven't had that before. And guardrails will give courts and other people who are reviewing uh, our gerrymandering system an opportunity to see whether people have followed the rules or not. Before, there basically weren't any rules, and now we have some. And now there's some other restrictions about how many times, uh, I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but how many times a county can be, can be broken, broken into different districts and all that kind of stuff. It will be better, but I don't want to, I don't want to give anybody the illusion that all of a sudden we're going to have a system in the state of Ohio that is um, competitive, that is that is based on on, on uh, numbers of people and and locations as opposed to party affiliation. Because we're still it's still going to be primarily written by the same people, and we're seeing the um, some of the, the things that they're trying to do even now because of the census. So so I think look, I think gerrymandering is the single most important threat or a single most threat, I guess important is the wrong word, the single, single biggest threat to our democracy in the state of Ohio, because everything else emanates from gerrymandering. This, this legislation that we're talking about, you know, if, if the people who were sponsoring this legislation didn't feel that they had to, to represent, were more concerned about the minority of people in their district who show up on primary day, Okay, if they were if they were more concerned if they were more concerned about the general election population than they were about their primary election population, we wouldn't be seeing these kind of radical uh, extremist pieces of legislation in the state of Ohio. There would be more bipartisan working uh, relationships because people wouldn't be punished by either side for working with uh, working with members across the across the aisle. So I think the gerrymandering, if we, you know, whatever we can do. I mean, obviously, we've had a couple of opportunities. One of them, you know, 
we, we really didn't take advantage of in the last decade. And so whatever we can do going forward that uh, uh, reduces, eliminates, modifies, whatever, uh, the gerrymandering system in the state of Ohio, um, we need to do because I think it is the origin of so much bad things in the state of Ohio that that's got to be our number one priority. Yeah, and I'll, uh, no, I agree. Um, I know that when we had, I know uh, many people are sitting there thinking, but wait, we had that citizens initiative, we voted, we said we wanted a change, there's supposed to be a change. And yes, that's true, but it didn't go as far as balancing things, it improved things. They, as, as Representative Leland just said, um, but we're still in this place where the majority leadership makes most of the call and the decisions. And at the end of the day, we'll have the ability to draw the lines. They have some, they have some, a few more rules they have to follow now. And we'll be able to see that. Uh, there will be opportunities this summer um, for people. There will be some opportunities to both see uh, proposed maps and for you to, you know, there's supposed to be some community process to that. Pay attention to the articles that you see and things as you see the discussions playing out right now. Um, there's already been one attempt to take the process, open up our con state's constitution and change the rules um, and circumvent the Supreme Court in the state of Ohio. Democrat, and again, I hate to put this into D and R uh, kinds of uh, explanations, but unfortunately, that's where we are. Uh, Democrats push back. The Ohio Legislative Black Caucus said, we don't think this is a good idea. And so we are working um, to get our census data, make some decisions, and then go from there. Um, and support our leadership, but it's, you have to be vigilant. It's, vigilance is the word right now. There's one other thing in the state of Ohio that compounds uh, gerrymandering. So we have gerrymandered districts where, where the politicians get to pick the people instead of the people picking their representatives. But there's one other thing that happened and changed that really makes for, um, for bad legislation and for um, a constant churn in the legislature. And frankly, that was term limits. What term limits did is, and I can see the, um, see the results of it right now. So with gerrymandering, we have the most extreme person uh, often being picked in a primary um, on the extreme end of, of, of their ideology, then coming to the legislature. Now add in term limits. So there's a lack of institutional memory and knowledge. There's a lack of understanding why we do things the way we do them. Um, and folks are coming in with maybe narrow agendas. Um, the days of us being able to work across the aisle, it's not totally gone, um, but it's more difficult to achieve. And my experience from going from the Senate, uh, from the House to the Senate, is that I'm finding, as you wouldn't, as you would expect, the people I'm working the best with across the aisle are folks that I've already served with. We served together in the House. Now we're in the Senate. We see each other as human beings first. Party affiliation second. We set aside, we work very hard, and I know Representative Leland does this as well. You work really hard to set aside the personal and really try to work on where we agree on issues, where we come together, can we work on this specific issue? That's how I get somebody like Christina Rogner on the death penalty bill as a co-sponsor, when on some other things, we are absolutely the polar opposite when it comes to women's reproductive rights. We've had the discussion, we've talked to each other, and we understand that there are things we're gonna agree to disagree on We've also had conversations about our families, about raising kids, and we see each other as human beings. Term limits have taken the ability for that to even be some, because it happens over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really taken that away uh, from the body. I, I understand why people thought it was important, um, but even my hope down the road is that one of the things that changes is just that the time period gets extended. Um, 
the first couple of years you're in the legislature trying to figure out what in the world, how to do this, how to be productive. It's difficult to establish leadership and the whole nine yards. So, so all those things together um, create that environment that then makes it uh, very difficult. Okay. Let's go a little bit farther into this uh, idea of bipartisanship and the uh, bridges that we need to build and actually the fact of partisanship nowadays. Uh, C.J. Cook asks, how can we, meaning us as citizens, but also meaning you as legislators, work with conservatives to address the issues we face? She says, I have been so discouraged by the more reactionary uh, folk taking over the Republican Party and attacking even uh, their more moderate members like Governor DeWine. So let's get a little bit more into the, the, the bridge thing, um, bridge building, not only in the legislature, but what we can do as well. Well, I mean, I, I, I'll just start out. I, I, actually, I feel very fortunate. The area that I spend most of my time in is in the area of criminal justice and criminal justice reform. And I think if there's one area, and maybe not just one, but, but, the, but certainly one area where there is obvious bipartisan cooperation, it's in the area of criminal justice. Um, we, you know, we've been working on a number of different bills. We just passed a bill. Uh, we, we did a lot of, we did a death penalty modification bill last session that uh, had strong bipartisan support. We almost uh, decriminalized uh, uh, drug uh, possession in the state of Ohio. We made it almost to the floor of the house, but we, we got there um, with bipartisan support. It was like in, when it came out of the House committee, it was four, four Republicans and, or th four Democrats and three Republicans. Um, I have a couple of pieces of legislation uh, that, are, that are being sponsored by myself and Representative Hillier dealing with um, uh, public defenders and, and, and bail and other issues that are, that are affecting people in the state of Ohio. So I, I see a lot of opportunities in the criminal justice area for bipartisan support. It's an area where the most conservative, like the Club for Growth and other, not, I'm not sure about the Club for Growth, it's the, what's the Koch organization called? Um, I, I can't Alec. remember it. No, it's Alec. not Alec. It's oh, not it's Alec. not Alec. No. Well, anyway, I apologize to them if they're watching because they're a great group and I apologize for not for not getting that. But, uh, you know, you'll see the ACLU and them on the same page as far as a lot of different issues are concerned involving uh, criminal justice. So Americans for Prosperity, Prosperity, thank you very much to whoever sent that to me. Um, and they and they, they were on the same page in a lot of different issues. So you know, I think you pick your friends, you know, you, 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 you look for, you know, I, I said, I'm willing to work with anybody that's willing to work with me. That's always been my, that's always been my mantra. And I think that should be your mantra. I don't think you should say, okay, well, we're not a hundred percent on the same side on every issue so that we're not going to work. So I can't trust this other organization or these other people. So I'm not going to work with them on this. I think, you know, you know, like my, Martin Luther, I, I keep channeling Martin Luther King today, but I mean, it's like, you know, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent interests. That's what we all have. We have just permanent interests. And when we can find friends uh, that, that, that can work together uh, on the same interests that we have, we should, because that's what it's all about. So I um, couldn't agree more. A, a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to to work with um, with a representative when we were both in the House, and we were trying to find a middle path for the fairness bill, the LGBT um, non discrimination bill. And um, his name was Bill is Bill Hayes, and um, he was very devout as well as being a legislator, and uh, started every committee with a prayer, a Christian prayer and um, did a number of other things, brought his faith into uh, conversations a lot. And I will admit, because um, I have had the conversations with him, it was a real turnoff for me. Um, I, I thought it made a lot of assumptions and it bothered me. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that he and I were put on um, a small working group to try to find a middle path for the fairness bill. 
And when I first walked in, I thought, this is never going to work. This is never going to happen. He is the polar opposite of me. And frankly, he walked in and thought the same thing. And over the time, we spent more than a year and a half uh, getting together with a, a small group of legislators that included the two of us to do this work. Both of us learned so much from each other. And I can't tell you how much respect, admiration, and, and just love I have for this man now as a result of all of that work that we did together. But we had to listen to each other. And at one point, members of the trans community, uh, trans, uh, some folks from Trans Ohio met with him because they knew um, from the conversations we were having that I shared with them, he was struggling with the whole idea of, of transgender people and how that all fit into the legislation. So they went to, his, they made an appointment with him in his community, met him at his local office, and they sat and had a conversation. A couple of the people were members of his community. Um, and they just talked through their life experience. They shared their life experience with him. As a result of that, he had a new deep understanding. Does it mean that he made a 360 degree turn on where he thought um, that part of the legislation should be? No. He did give a little and he, he made some concessions. He thought there were some things we could do. But I think the most valuable thing out of it was that neither, nobody saw each other as, as Representative just pointed out as permanent enemy, enemies. And that, and that there was something we could all learn from each other. I, it's part of my practice as a Unitarian to do that, to meet people where they are, to see someone in front of me and, and remind myself of the value, dignity, and worth of that person. And I think we all have to do that. So I never, um, as an advocate, I would say, meet with those people who you think you have nothing in common with or that you don't think will ever move on your issue. Meet with them and share your, your experience in your life and why, why that change makes such a difference. It may or may not move them in that moment, they may carry it around for a while, but I think you contribute to making that change then. It's really bending the arc um, that Martin Luther King spoke of. I don't think it happens all at once. I think it happens incrementally. Ted, did you have the next question? I did, thank you. So um, thank you both for those comments once again. I know folk in my congregation are, are certainly worried about dark money and money in politics more generally. Um, and I know that there's, there have been efforts previously to kind of get some transparency on how money could affect politics. Um, can y'all give us an update on what likelihood is there that any more transparency might be shown on this issue or what, what, what is the state of money in politics? Thank you. Well, I mean, you just saw the largest bribery scandal in the history of the state of Ohio that involves $61 million to, to advocate for the legislation. I mean, it, it's money in politics is alive and well in the state of Ohio. I mean, we just, we've been, we've been experiencing that for the last couple of, uh, last couple of years, uh, just in this one indication. And, and I don't think, you know, I, I, I'm not, you know, I haven't checked in any of the any of the stats lately, but I don't think people are raising less money. I don't think people are spending less money on TV, uh, whether it's from Ohio or from national or whatever. You see these Republicans that are running for the United States Senate, creating these $10 million packs of 501c4 money that's going to be supporting them. I mean, you're, you know, this is, look, you know, this is all because of the Citizens United uh, d decision by the United States Supreme Court. Um, and so the way that you really address this issue is either, you know, is either the, the Congress um, passes legislation that, re, that revokes Citizen United or we get a Supreme Court someday that um, will, will revoke the idea that people who have the most money have the same freedom of speech based on their money as opposed to people who don't have money. And that's, that's where it all is. I mean, that's where it comes from. Uh, you know, you can tell people, I mean, I, 
sure, I'm in favor of transparency, but I don't know that I don't know that it's the panacea that people think that it is. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, because for example, in this last election, um, everybody pretty much knew who the people were who were the beneficiaries of the sixty-one million dollar bribery scandal, and yet not many of them, if not most of them, or not all of them, I think actually all of them were reelected. Everybody who was a beneficiary of the $61 million bribery scandal was reelected in the 2020 election. So, and I don't think anybody on this call would, would say that that wasn't pretty heavily publicized um, throughout the state of Ohio. So I'm not sure that transparency or making it available to people is the end product. You know, you either, you know, at the end of the day, I think the best way to do this is what the state of Arizona did when, uh, and, and, you know, part of the problem with being a person of my age, I keep forgetting people's names, but um, as a former governor of the state of Arizona, she later became Homeland Security. Uh, somebody, somebody sent me a lifeline. Um, she later became the head of uh, Homeland Security under the Obama administration. Anyway, she got elected um, governor of Arizona um, because, uh, because they had a public financing system in the state of Arizona where people... Uh, you know, could run for office. They needed to establish a certain level of financial support. I can't remember exactly what the number was. I think running for governor was like, I think it was like $500, $5 contributions. Or it, I, don't quote me on the number, but there was a certain level of, of grassroots financial support. Thank you, Janet Napolitano. Um, there was a certain amount of, of, of grassroots financial support that was required in order to qualify for the money. And then if somebody came in and was a deep bot pocket candidate that had a lot of money on their own, then the money that came from the state of Arizona was increased um, to make up for the fact that you had some deep pocket people that were spending money on their own. She got elected, there was, you know, there was it was a great system. Unfortunately, they threw it out. It, those are the kind of systems, if you're really gonna take uh, big money out of politics. Those are the kind of systems we're going to have to create. They've been created in this country before, but that's what we need to do. So one, we need to figure out a way to get around Citizens United. And two, we need to create an Arizona type system uh, for campaign financing or campaign expenditures um, in Ohio and other states. So one of the ways that um, that communities have dealt with this is, um, now this is an old statistic because it's July 19, 800 local community governments, 20 states have passed resolutions on overturning Citizens United. And in the process of doing that, what they've done is educate, educated their citizenry. But as the representative just pointed out, um, in Ohio, in spite of the fact that we had this incredible scandal that really was rooted in dark money, um, it persisted. I think on a on a election by election um, basis, what people can do um, is educate themselves about the candidate. I have to tell my stepmother a lot when she says, "But I saw this ad on TV that said these terrible things about this person that you said was the best candidate," and it's like educating her about where do you get the the information on the candidate right. um, is important too because. Dark money pays a whole lot of money for those negative ads as well. So, um, but beyond that, I, you know, it's an ongoing struggle, but as long as Citizens United stands, we have this issue. Thank you for that, because that has been a point of discussion um, in a number of different groups, number of different nonprofits, and our congregations too, because it is a moral issue. Uh, we do know that there's rumors and rumors of rumors of a uh, voting restrictions bill coming to Ohio. Um, maybe next week, maybe the week after, I don't know. You guys might. But I want to go positive rather than talk about what the restrictions are. I'd like to ask you guys, what reforms do you think would engender the most turnout and the best possible elections here in Ohio. You know, what, sure. what actions could we take or support for that? Sure, um, it's, Senator Sandra Williams and I introduced a bill last General Assembly, we're gonna introduce it again. And I know there's legislation in the house 
um, it, you know, to to update the vote by mail process requiring every registered voter to receive an absentee ballot application, including a pay, prepaid return envelope, uh, create a process for voters to complete and submit an absentee ballot application online, um, which is, it's a really awkward system right now. Um, if they restrict in-person voting in any way, every registered voter should be able to be sent an absentee ballot, uh, bypassing the request process so we could have an election. So what I'm talking about is if we ever have a pandemic emergency like we had last year where um, the election was delayed, you know, our legislation would just just tr send it to everyone. Just send it to everyone. There are states that do that right now. They just send everyone the absentee ballot um, application and get the process started. They assume at least everyone wants it. Well, and in, in Oregon, it's the only way they vote. Um, also updating election day procedures, allowing counties to have multiple drop boxes. This has been contentious. Um, but what we know it does is um, especially when you're getting closer to election day, just allow people to be able to drop off their ballots, but do it, you know, we have, we have uh, one size does not fit all for our counties. Vinton County is the smallest county by population. They have 8,593 registered voters. Um, Cuyahoga County has 882,000 registered, I'm sorry, that's Franklin County, 882,000 registered voters in Franklin County. One size does not fit all, okay? So we need to be able to have, um, and have some, we talk a lot about local control. This is a case where the local counties and the communities need to be able to say, okay, we can, we can, um, we can watch over maybe two or three drop boxes and, and then have them have some accountability, have some rules around what that looks like. Is there a camera? Is it secure? Is it, you know, is it watched all day? Whatever it is, um, but have those local communities come up with some of those kinds of um, requirements and, and priorities around how to do that. One of the ideas is just require all school buildings to be closed on election day and use them for general elections, but, you know, take the kids out of it. Um, I know when I uh, had, when my kids were young, we took our kids with us to vote. Um, and then we just need to harmonize Ohio's voter registration process. Um, you're asked one thing online, you're asked something else when you do it in person. We just need to get it all consistent um, and make sure that everyone, regardless of whether they drive or not, um, has the ability to um, show ID that they may have to be able to do this. Um, and whether that's, you know, a bill or whatever, um, some kind of a utility bill. The other thing is right now you'll hear um, them saying that they're um, creating an automatic system at the DMV. Right now, the DMV is opt out. We need to keep it that way. Um, that is very different from just waiting for you to ask if you could register to vote. It's very different if someone says, okay, so I'm going to check this box so you're a registered voter, right? And you just say, yeah, okay. Um, it's a big, it's a big difference. And so, um, things like that, that just make it open and more accessible for people to vote. Look, if I was queen of the world, <laughs> what I would do is have, have election day be a paid national holiday, um, and still have those days up to it for mail-in voting and everything else, but, but really create a, a time or a couple of days where, where people can actually have access to the ballot box. At the end of the day, that's what we need uh, people to have. So I, I agree with everything that uh, Senator Antonio uh, has said, and I support all, all of those uh, reforms and all those additions that uh, she was talking about. Um, but I want you to, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, I don't wanna be the, uh, the snake in the punch bowl, but I, um, 
you know, I just want you to remember that, you know, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, you voted on election day. Um, I was actually remember when they expanded the election hours to the where they are now because it was one hour less and there was no um, and there was no uh, vote by mail whatsoever unless you basically signed an affidavit saying you were half dead then you couldn't make it to the uh, to the polls. Um, I remember all those elections and you know our turnout has not been substantially greater um, in since we've changed the laws and we've we've put early voting and we've done vote by mail and we've done all these other things, maybe with the exception of the last election because of the extraordinary efforts that people went through, the turnout numbers have not been that significantly different. Um, and so this goes to the first point that I made in my opening statement. D democracy is just a vessel, okay? It's a vessel. It it's like a computer. It's like what they used to say about the computer, garbage in, garbage out, okay? Democracy is just a vessel. You know, just because you have lots and lots of people voting doesn't mean you're going to get the outcome that you want. Um, the largest turnouts in the state of Ohio, in uh, as I said earlier, um, have resulted in the elections of Donald Trump, um, George Bush, Ronald Reagan, um, people like that. Those have been the largest uh, turnouts in the state of Ohio. And so while I agree that we need to do everything we can to make sure that uh, everybody gets a chance to vote. That's just half the battle. That's just half the battle. Uh, the, the battle is making sure people understand why it's important for them to vote, what they have at stake, what, why it's important that people like Senator Antonio and others get elected to, to public office because they're fighting for real things that, 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 that matter to people uh, on a daily basis. That's got to be, you know, that's got to be uh, the priority here. You know, like I said, I'm in favor of all the activities that, that uh, make it easier for people to be able to participate. But then getting them to participate and then making sure they participate in the right way. And, I, and I'm, I'm unabashedly saying that, you know, people should be doing things in a certain way. I've been fighting for this certain way for 50 years, okay? So making sure that people actually understand what's in their best interests that all these, these, all these bells and whistles, these bright lights over on the other side saying, hey, forget about your job, forget about the minimum wage, forget about the fact that you don't have health care, forget about the fact that you can't feed your family. Take a look at this gun law over here or take a look at this person over here that's, that may be coming in from Mexico that you should be scared of. Take a look at all those things because there's other things that they really don't matter. This is what's important. And so doing our job of making sure people understand what the issues are and what's in their best interest has got to be just as big a priority as, as making the, the process accessible. And, and I'll just add, absolutely. Um, but the other thing is it, it begs the question then, and I think somebody in the chat is even asking, said something about making sure kids uh, register to vote and um, absolutely when they turn 18 and, and actually they can vote in that um, they can register when they're 17 if they're going to be 18 by the time of the election. But I think the other thing is teaching our kids at an early age how important this is. I mean, you know, we, my kids still recycle because they were taught in school and came home and, and really I recycled first because my kids were saying, we got to do this, mom. This is important to the planet. Kids have to understand at a very early age, and, and there are a lot of programs out there, but we probably could increase them to make sure that our children uh, grow up with this idea that is an expectation that it is part of holding on to our democracy, the way we keep an, a democracy that works for everyone is by being engaged in it as soon as possible and understanding at a young age why that's so important. Thank you both so much. So we, we've talked about a lot of different things so far today, right? We, we, we've kind of covered a whole whole range of different issues that, and I think we've covered a, a good deal of, of positive and negative negative things happening in our state. But what other policies or or initiatives are there that that you guys are aware of that could help support democracy? Um, I don't know if Representative Leland, would you like to take a first shot at this? 
Well, I sort of talked about it before. I think the whole gerrymandering process is is something that really is institutional corruptness that just affects almost everything that, that, that happens in the state of Ohio and, and nationally, because obviously you see what, you know, if you're gerrymandering Ohio and Texas and various other states, then it, then it has an impact on what goes on um, in the, uh, uh, you know, in the National Congress. And one issue that I've been very, very strong, I've introduced it three times in the General Assembly, um, is the national popular vote. I think that um, we as a country, I, I could spend a half an hour talking about the Electoral College. I won't. I won't bore people with it. But I could, I could spend a long time talking about how the Electoral College is just not a viable uh, way of electing people as president of the United States. Um, you know, maybe back in 1796, uh, the idea was that uh, the electorate uh, is not educated, and so we needed this blue ribbon committee of people that would meet after the people had a chance to vote and then decide whether or not they had done the right thing or not. You know, you, we can sit here and debate whether or not that was a good idea back in 1796 or even today, but that's not even happening. That's not even happening. I mean, the, the, the electors are now just rubber stamping what the people do, and they're doing it in a corrupt, um, misrepresented way so that the people in Wyoming have 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 uh, 16 times more representation uh, in the presidential election than people in the state of Ohio. So, so I, whatever we can do to reform uh, the Electoral College, uh, to reform gerrymandering, I think those are two important issues um, uh, that are going to affect us going forward. So whatever we can do in those areas, I think, are, would be my two top priorities as far as democracy is concerned. Totally agree, actually, with that. I think I think I would love to attend the master class on that. Um, maybe maybe you can uh, put that on sometime because because I have have definitely come to believe um, that that we need to get rid of the electoral college at this point. Um, but for all the reasons you mentioned, and I'm sure there's many more. You know, um, one newspapers tagline is democracy dies in darkness and so we have to continue to shine a light sometimes on the days when it's the hardest for me to be in the legislature because I'm so kind of overwhelmed and frustrated by the bigness of some of these um, the potential uh, consequences of some of this legislation that comes uh, to us is that um, I'm lifted up by the fact that we have the opportunity to shine a light on this, to have conversations like this. Um, one of the best things that um, was done in both the Senate and the House is that our committee hearings and our legislative sessions are streamed and archived. Um, and while and, and you know when something is really controversial, because if you go back and look, you may not you may not be able to find that particular clip. And it's because somebody edited it. Um, actually, now that I think about it, we should probably do something about that. But, um, but for the most part, they are all there. Um, we are streamed. And, and that makes, we had to fight to have bicameral committees. The last one, the Joint Medicaid Oversight Committee, for some odd reason, was not being streamed. Um, and I fought for two years and, and I was joined by uh, Senator um, Huffman, Steve Huffman, and we finally pushed and pushed so that now all of the committees, even the bicameral ones, are being streamed. Um, that makes the difference. Whether you watch or not, you can always find it on archive. But again, it's seeing, seeing us working and seeing the issues that are coming forward, um, bringing it into the light. I think is critically important. And so um, my, my concern over uh, the past few years is that um, it's more important now than ever because we cannot deny that there are sh um, these little shreds of fascism that are moving into, um, into the highest levels of our government. It, when when an autocrat says, because they're functioning like an autocrat, um, your allegiance is to me first. Um, that's a problem. 
because that's not how the United States of America was set up. And, um, and so we, we have to be not only um, vigilant, but I think it's, again, uh, raising our voices. And, and when you do that, other, other folks chime in as well. And so I, um, I have, I, I want to go back a minute to the hope question too, though. Um, I think the thing that has been giving me the most hope the last maybe two years is our young people. I, I have been impressed by their courage, um, their ability to, to somehow weave through all of the, um, misinformation and frankly BS that's been out there and be able to tell things like they are, like they see them, and then also raise their voices, gather together. I mean, Greta Thunberg, this child stood up to an autocrat in the, in the United States when she's talking about um, the environment and saving our planet. And it's like, if we have mod role models like that, um, I think not only are we, um, there's hope, but I also think there's, there's a collective hope for some kind of change. And, and we don't have to always do things the way we've always done them just because we've always done them that way. And I'm, I'm hopeful that, that um, our young people are gonna come up with some different ways uh, to look at the solutions as well. And, and I think um, being an informed citizen has to be at the top of the list so that when you're voting and if we can get to the point where every vote actually does count um, and then um, it goes into that collective pool to be able to elect people, um, I think that that'll be critical going forward. Right. Well, we're certainly thankful for the, all the time you've given us and I'm going to ask you in just a second for any final words of wisdom that you want to leave with us today. Uh, as you can tell, we Unitarian Universalists take our democracy very seriously. And, and David, you should know that it's uh, one of our seven principles, democracy, the democratic process, both in our congregations and in the larger society. So knowing that you're speaking to a bunch of folk who really take democracy seriously, um, what, what final words might you have for us today? Thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for working hard on the issues that are important to all of us. I mean, thank you for, for standing up for America, for Ohio, for Columbus, for wherever you're from. I mean, no, none of us in the legislature are able to do any of this without people helping us do this um, and people who decide to run themselves. Um, for these offices. Hopefully somebody in this group will, will do that uh, in, in, in the future. But just thank you. Thank you for your commitment uh, to the cause. Thank you to your commitment to the founding principles and to the values that we all hold forth in this country and this state. And so I just appreciate the opportunity to have worked with each and every one of you here this morning and, and in other situations. And I appreciate your commitment to making Ohio uh, a better place for all of us. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. It, it's good to be with um, Representative Leland. We don't get to see each other as much because we're in separate chambers right now. However, um, we do get to work together, especially um, with when we send bills to his committee. Um, so I appreciate his leadership and insight. Uh, and it was nice to be with you this morning. So, um, and thanks Thank to all of you at UU Joe for uh, again, inviting me back. I. I want to say um, I saw something in the chat about local news and and you know being disappointed with, um, with with the offerings that are available. I think it's really important to seek out those independent sources. Independent news sources um, I think are how it's certainly how I start my day. Um, I have a number of I can't remember their names, but. I have a number of news journals and things that I read every morning. Um, 
local and then I go national. Um, we read The Nation, we read Mother Jones and, and some, other, um, some other journals that just give us a different perspective, um, sort of uh, filter through um, the noise sometimes. And I think that's really important. Uh, I know we depend on our local observers here in Cleveland. There's a, a whole host of them. Um, but we have some local community papers that I would suggest you really seek out. And by the way, write opinion pieces and put them in those local newspapers. You know, talk to your community, your fellow community members about what's important to you and share it. Um, because I think you'll find some kindred spirits um, on the local level as well. I want to thank you so much for the work that you all do. Um, I know it's relent. You are relentless. You persevere, and um, and that's important. I love seeing you when you come to the state house, and I I have um, I have faith and hope in our democracy because of all of us and because of all the people that we brought into the room this morning by talking about them who aren't here but are certainly on the front lines working with us. And as David said, we, we don't, we're all connected. The thread that connects us is, is this desire to build a more perfect union, um, to, to have a democracy that works for everyone. And so that's the silver thread that connects us all. So I am just, this was a wonderful way uh, to start my Saturday with you all. And um, I just appreciate so much the time that we've had together and the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Antonio. Thank you, Representative Leland. Our thanks and gratitude to, uh, to Representative Upchurch that had to leave a little bit early. And thanks to all of you who, for participating in this discussion. And thanks to Tad for wonderful questions too, and all of the rest of you. So we are grateful. I know I learned a great deal. Thank you all so much. Now, just to, uh, to turn to something a little bit uh, different before we uh, take our break, because we'll take a break from noon until 1230. And then when we come back, we're going to be talking about the eighth principle in Unitarian Universalism with Samuel Prince, who is the chair of UU Justice Ohio. And I want to say right now that, you know, the late Representative John Lewis said, when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. And so right now, I want to turn to Kristen Byrice, who's going to tell us a little bit about how we can do something together to address the threats that we've been talking about uh, the threats to our democracy and how we can join together. So Kristen, I want to turn it over to you. Thank you, Reverend Joan. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kristen Byrice. I'm a community organizer with you, Joe. I work closely with Joan all week long, and I see a lot of familiar names and faces on the screen today, so it's ex I'm excited to see all of you here. Um, I, I just want to point out, you've heard a lot today from our representatives in the state about mobilizing, organizing, talking to your representatives. Um, I love that Senator Antonio pointed out writing letters. A lot of that is uh, what I work with within you, Joe, and it's a great way to stop or slow this machine that seems to be going to threaten our democracy in several different ways. My focus and what I'm here to talk to you about today is the Our Voices Together Coalition. As Reverend Joan mentioned, this is a group of 30 social justice organizations across Ohio, including you, Joe, and many, I know several of you here have been participating with us. Uh, we are raising our voices together to prevent the anti-protest bills that have been in committee and that are being looked at by our representatives. We are working together as a coalition to bring attention to the assault on our constitutional rights in Ohio right now at this moment. So you have just heard, I know Reverend Joan has mentioned several bills. If you haven't heard about uh, HB 22, HB 109, and all these bills that we keep talking about, 
A great way to learn is to join us in the coalition and learn more. We've been educating through social media. Uh, we have done many events to take action on this. It's a great way to do all the things that you've just heard about is through our coalition. Some of the things that we have done this year is we have written letters to DeWine asking him not to sign SB 33. We can't always succeed. It was still signed infrastructure sites that are environmental infra infrastructure in particular. Um, protesting there has become more difficult because that bill went through. But that is not the only bill that's anti-protest bill. We have others that are still out there. And we wanted to bring attention to these bills as I believe it was Senator Antonio said that we need to get out there and we need to stand on the streets and we need to educate our fellow Ohioans about what is going on. And Protest While You Can was an event that we held on April 10th. I'll show a picture for you. That was a statewide protest is, again, putting our voices together to stop these anti-protest bills. Over 350 people across Ohio showed up to do chalk drawings, hand out flyers, take pictures, and showing what we are up against in these anti-protest bills. You can see some of the signs pointing out the things that might be a felony offense should HB 109 go through or HB 22 go through or SB 41. These are the three bills we are currently focused on at this moment. We've also written testimony. I'm going to go ahead and stop share so you don't see that. Uh, we've also written testimony. We've gone to the state house. We did 65 testimonies one day in protest of or standing up against as HB 22. We did 35 another day. We've had people from across the state going to the state house again, standing up and testifying, plus sending in testimony when they can't go to the state house or don't want to go to the state house or it's just not convenient for them. And we are planning, so here's where you come in right now. This is how you can get involved this moment, today, right now, is coming up, we are having a Stir Up the House event. Our goal is to stir up House members to be talking about these bills. If we don't talk to them about our thoughts on them and bring it to their mind, they aren't thinking about it at this moment because it's in committee. So a lot of members are not in the committee. There are 99 members of the House. There are only, I think, 12 or 13 members of the committee. Most of them are thinking about their other things that are actually on the House floor. Our goal is to bring it up, talk to our legislators, get it in front of their minds so that we can then have a conversation with them and they can have a conversation with other people in the House. Whether we get an appointment with the House member or the aide, doesn't matter. The goal is to get them talking. So we are doing Stir Up the House the week of April, uh, May 10th through the 14th. We are hoping that you'll get small groups of people together, two, three people, grab a friend, grab a minister, grab a neighbor, anybody you can grab to come with you and talk to your legislator. We have a toolkit to help you. We've been creating toolkits all year to help with all of this work. And we would love to have you join in in whatever way that you can. Uh, most of these will be via Zoom. Some people will require you to come to the State House, but most of them will be by Zoom and you can request that. So we hope that you will take part. Uh, if not that, do testimony. HP 109 is expected to come up. It's a large anti-protest bill. We are expecting it to come up for testimony in the next few weeks. So I hope that you will participate. And let me share screen again so that you can see how to participate. We have a sign up link to take action. So you can sign up right there on our action alerts. And I'm putting it in the chat for you. We would love to have, I would love to have everybody on this call grab a group of two or three people and go talk to their legislators the week of May 10th through the 16th. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Okay, so how do we keep all this stuff going? How do we keep uh, Kristen going in the work that she does or support you all when you do your testimony and other such things? And how do we get word out? We get out the word and we are able to do this work because of the support we receive from you. So we are trying something a little bit different for us, a little bit new this spring in, as a fundraiser. Um, as a way of having all of us join together in our support, and that is an auction. 
Now, some of you are familiar with auctions from your own congregation. We're trying one online for UUJO. And uh, Kristen is going to be putting a slide up there in just a moment. Uh, our fundraising auction, it starts today and bidding uh, goes until May 15th. We have 14 absolutely wonderful items. I don't have pictures of all of them up here, but everything from telescopes to fiber art to books to original ink uh, and pen drawings uh, to some uh, gift baskets for dogs and people. So I urge you all to, to check out our auction items, uh, see if you want to bid on one of them. And then with the winning bids, I'll be contacting you and we can arrange delivery and we can arrange payment at that point. So you don't have to create a whole bunch of uh, uh, accounts or anything like that to bid. We settle up at the end. So that is, uh, is something that I'm inviting you all to participate in. And as a special part of this auction, we have a raffle of an absolutely glorious piece of fiber art by Judy Pascalis uh, up in Toledo. It's 19 inches by 18 inches, so it's kind of a large piece. And it's a, it's a quilt block and embroidery, and it is uh, depicting the justice aspirations of immigrants and black and brown people and homeless and aging folk, uh, LGBTQ people and others who came to the United States to live up to, to try and live into that promise of justice for all. And this was developed for UUJO and for our auction, uh, or in this case, it's a raffle. And with the raffle, you can get a ticket for 10 bucks, just 10 bucks, or you can get three of them for 25 bucks. Or if you want to buy six of them, it's only 50. I mean, we've got this all lined out uh, when you click on the link for the raffle because that is going to help fund the work of UUJO going forward. The drawing for this piece of wonderful art, justice art, is going to be July 4th. So that, that's a very appropriate day for that to happen. All right, and uh, the links are all in your chat. And so while we're taking our lunch break, you can go and look at the auction and you can go and, and buy some raffle tickets. And we will be breaking now, since it is noon, and we will come back at 12.30. Uh, you don't have to sign off, just leave it open so you don't have any hassles coming back in. And uh, at 12.30, we will be in discussion with Samuel Prince about the Eighth Principle Project in Unitarian Universalism. So thank you all for being here this morning.